Now, Schofield taught what we call today hyperdispensationalism, and in fact, in his notes, he said that Israel at Mount Sinai rashly exchanged grace for the law, and so thereby the way of salvation changed, and from that point on, he taught that salvation throughout the rest of the Old Testament was by works and not by faith alone. And so continually throughout his notes, he teaches hyper dispensationalism that the way of salvation changes from age to age. But back in Galatians chapter number three, this chapter is a chapter that destroys dispensationalism. Because dispensationalism basically teaches this, that throughout the ages and throughout history, that the way of salvation has changed. That throughout each successive age that would come, that basically God's plan of salvation failed in every age, and therefore God had to come up with a new plan, and for each dispensation there's a different way of salvation that people were saved in many different ways. Dispensational salvation is clearly a false doctrine and a very dangerous false doctrine. For one, it's very clear in the Bible that salvation has always been by grace through faith. It's very clear in the New Testament that Abraham was justified by faith without works. So right there, that proves even in the Old Testament, salvation was by faith. David said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And through you have example after example of verses in the Old Testament that clearly show salvation was by faith. But even in the New Testament, it will often reference examples in the Old Testament to prove that salvation is by faith. Now, if dispensational salvation were true, then why would someone in the New Testament dispensation be using Old Testament examples to prove a salvation by faith without works? It's very clear in the New Testament that many of the Jews struggled with the idea of a salvation without works. And they would often go to the Old Testament to prove that salvation was by faith without works. Now look at Galatians chapter number three and let's just see if the way of salvation, if it ever changed throughout the ages. Look at what the Bible says down in verse number 21 and the Bible says that there is the law then against the promises of God. God forbid, for if, Hey, that English language, it'll trip you up, won't it? Look at what it says there. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Hey, what is the Bible saying? But the Bible saying that, hey, if salvation, if there could have been a law given, that that is the way that salvation should have always been. That that would have been the way that we would have been saved. If we could just be saved by keeping the law, by being good enough, by keeping the commandments, by keeping the sacrifices, by doing the Passover, by being circumcised, by doing all those things that were in the law, then that is the way that salvation should have remained. But guess what? Sal salvation could never be by the law. And that's why the Bible says in the very next verse, verse number 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that what? That believe, the Bible says. You see, salvation has always been by faith. It's always been by belief. And this one passage right there proves that. Hebrews chapter number 11 is another passage that destroys dispensationalism because in Hebrews chapter number 11, in the very beginning, it says these obtained a good report through faith. And in the very end, after it's talked about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Jephthah and Barak and Samson, it says, and these all obtained a good report through faith. Every one of them. Hey, those are men that spanned many different so-called ages. I mean, they went through many so-called dispensations, and yet every one of them obtained a good report, the Bible says, through faith. The basic element of modern dispensationalism and that which gave the movement its name is the belief that human history is divided into well-defined periods or dispensations in which God relates to man in different ways according to the classical definition of C.I. Schofield, one of the movement's leading theologians. A dispensation is a period of time during which man is tested in respect 
to obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. Seven such are distinguished in Scripture. What they're essentially teaching here is works. Yeah. Adam had to do the works. Noah had to build the ark to get saved. And they, David had to do certain things to get saved. And they turned salvation into works in every period of time, except now we happen to be in the, the lucky one, right? Yeah. But yet, God is unchanging. He says, I change not. Yeah. The Gospel has always been the same. Yeah. In Genesis chapter 4, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. What were they calling for? Salvation right. of the soul, of the spirit, knowing that it was by believing on the Lord. But for you to talk about, like Mr. Schofield did, that there was one day a dispensation of the law and now a dispensation of grace, that irks the fire out of my Baptist brains. I used to sit and hear preachers talk about the dispensation of law and the dispensation of grace, and I had the same idea that you have, many of you. You have the idea, and I had it, that there was a day in the Old Testament when men were saved by keeping the law. But in the New Testament, they're saved by grace. If you didn't have a Schofield Bible or Larkin's charts, you would never in this world come up with any such thing as a dispensation of grace. Bless your little pea-picking, cotton-picking heart. The dispensation of grace started as soon as man fell in the Garden of Eden and will continue until the last man is saved in the millennium. The dispensation of grace always has been, always will be. God's grace did not begin with the coming of Bethlehem. God always was saving people by grace through faith. And the purpose of the law in the Old Testament is the same purpose of the law in the New Testament to show man that he's exceeding sinful and cannot save himself and cause him to get to Jesus in a hurry. Now I said, with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new gospel. I said, with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new church. I said, with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new dispensation. In fact, dispensationalism is, and what it is, is it is a false doctrine that they use to bring in whatever doctrine they want. I mean, that's exactly what it's for, that they can just use it and twist the scriptures around if they want to bring in some kind of weird teaching. Well, it's dispensationalism that allows them to do that. You don't know how long the earth was here. For all I know, the carbon dating might be right. Who knows? Well, what about dinosaurs? What about them? Were they here prior to Adam being here? I don't know. Maybe. Were they here as a result of the angels falling and them getting turned into aquatic reptilian beings? I don't know. The devil sure was, turning into a seven-headed red dragon. I don't know. Were they here before the earth got knocked out of kilter and got knocked off of his axis? And was it as a result of uh, angels uh, breeding not just with women, but also breeding with animals? And so basically what they teach is that not only did angels cohabitate with uh, with women and they were giants born to them but then they take it even farther into strange doctrine and teach that those angels then taught man how to mingle his seed with animals and that there's all these hybrids that are born and that's why you have the centaurs which were half man and half goat and you have the unicorns and all this other stuff that they talk about and they just take that doctrine into some really strange doctrine. I don't know, there could be that taking place, there could be some things because there's centaurs and satyrs in your Bible, there's satyrs, there's unicorns in the Bible. Well, a unicorn is really a goat that's very powerful, it's an ox and, and so on and so forth. I never thought of that as a unicorn at all. I think of it a horse with a thing with wings on it. You don't think the Bible's telling you the truth when it says a satyr? What is a satyr? It's a half man, half goat. You say, what is that? That's a combination of human beings and animals. And the Bible says, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. What did the Bible say? After their kind and every winged fowl after his kind and God saw that it was good. Look down to verse 24. The Bible says, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind and it was so. 
You know what? Everything in this world brings forth after their own kind. It is impossible to mingle the seed of man with an animal and to produce a living thing. You know why? Because God set boundaries back in the very beginning that everything brings forth after its kind. There's this holiest, what the Bible college teachers call the holy of holies. That's what they put on that paper I studied. Anyway, amen. You get over here in this holiest, what the Bible calls it, it's where God is. You know, that's where the Shekinah glory of God is. There's no light needed here because when God shows up, there'll be light. The only light's here. There's outside light that shines in that outer court. From the outside, there's an illuminating light of the Holy Spirit's work in the holy place. But here, in this holiest, there's no need for a candle. Because when God shows up, there'll be a Shekinah. There'll be a light. There'll be a visibility. You'll see all things clearly over here. That word Shekinah or Shekinah is never found in the Bible one time. It's never found in the Hebrew. It's just never been used in the Bible before the time of Christ. But after the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and had their apostate, rabbinical, uh, Judaism religion that's based on the Babylonian Talmud and not on the Bible, that's where they came up with this concept of Shekinah. And if you go to a Jewish website and look up what they teach about Shekinah, they teach that this is a feminine name for God and that it represents the female aspect of God. And what they teach in Judaism is that God is both male and female. And I asked a, a Jewish rabbi, I said, you know, where in the Bible does it teach that God is both male and female? Because all throughout the Bible it says he, him, his, he, but they, they say, no, no, no. God is both male and female. And so when we talk about God, sometimes we call him by his name Shekinah. And the Jews say that when they call him by Shekinah, they'll use the word she about God. So tribulation anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Now that smacks in the face of uh, an Anderson crowd again and, and, and anybody. A typical fundamentalist crowd that uh, looks, you know, has the same old hang up about looking forward to the cross, the Old Testament saints, which is the biggest dumbest bunch of junk you could ever come up with and a lot of you good folks out there you just can't keep carrying a bible around without believing it sure and uh so in the old testament gentiles that were looking for god seeking for immortality and uh, that's what romans one's all about about looking up and seeing the god up in heaven they had no clear revelation of jesus christ in the old testament and uh that, that's the uh, they were they were saved by their conscience and so we're and, and but uh so some folks, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something, it's, I was on an airplane and I was reading Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Charts and he said that that verse could apply even to the heathen today if they have no gospel, the opportunity to hear the truth, but they're looking for it. Now the question comes to mind, what about all these unsaved heathen? What about these people who've never heard the gospel? When they die, do they really go to hell? What about those in heathen countries where they've never seen a missionary, never seen a Bible, never been handed a gospel tract, never seen a television program or heard a radio broadcast? If they die without Jesus Christ, will they go to hell? And I would like to tell you no, they'd go to heaven, but since I believe the Bible, I must tell you exactly what the Bible says. And the Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of of God. You say, but they, they've never heard about Jesus Christ. God would be unfair, God would be unrighteous to let them die and go into hell and burn forever and ever. They're ignorant, and since they're ignorant, they should go to heaven. But the Bible said in Acts 17, verse 30, that God at one time winked at ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere, that means in China, that means in Russia, that means in the communist countries where no missionaries can go with the gospel. All men everywhere are commanded to repent. And if men went to heaven because they were ignorant, we're going at evangelizing the world the wrong way. The Bible never says, follow your conscience and thou shalt be saved. A conscience cannot be followed unless it's properly educated. The Catholic's conscience bothers him and he doesn't go to Mass. I never have been to Mass and my conscience doesn't bother me at all. It's the difference in our education. Come on.
You must properly educate the conscience. The Bible nowhere says follow your conscience. The light of creation, the light of conscience is not enough. A man cannot go out in the woods or the mountains and, the, and look up and see the, see the mountains and the trees and the sunset and say, I believe there must be a God. Go to heaven. He won't go to heaven like that. The Bible never says believe and be saved. The Bible always identifies the object of faith. It is always believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. No clothes mentioned in the first thing. You say, why? They're covered in light, just like the Adam's covered in light. Why? Because the Bible says the devil can appear as an angel of what? I wonder where he learned that. When he appears, he can appear as an angel of light, as ministers and ministers of righteousness. But uh, a debate, sadly, is long-ranged among uh, people who believe the Bible and some who don't believe the Bible as to whether or not there is a what's been termed a gap between Genesis 1 and verse 1 and Genesis 1 and verse 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All right, so would you agree that's in the beginning? All right, now the second verse. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now the question becomes this. Did something happen between 1-1 one, one and 1-2? One, this is what Ruckman says. Genesis 1-1 one, one refers to a date much earlier, maybe millions of years. Nobody knows the exact time of the original creation of the world in verse 1. Genesis 1-2 is not the original creation because 2 Peter 3-5-6 3, 3, tells us something happened to the original creation. Genesis 1-2 says something terrible happened, a great calamity of some kind, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. This is undoubtedly connected with the events of Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, but fundamentalists who write apologetic literature about the flood have all rejected 2 Peter 3 as referring to Genesis 1-2, which of course it does. So the moderate apostate fundamentalist is just as heretical as a modern evolutionist, at least where rejection of the King James text is concerned. The earth was immersed in water in Genesis 1-2, according to 2 Peter 3, and that comes from Ruckman, uh, his Theological Studies, Book 16, out of Pensacola, Florida. And if you open up your Schofield Reference Bible, I'll let you kind of see this. You can kind of see I've got some highlighted here above and below. So basically up here is all notes. Down here is all notes. And this little section right here is the reference, is the scripture. So which one's more prominent on page number one, the scripture or Schofield? Schofield is on page number one. Now he, or page three in the Schofield Reference Bible. Now, if you start reading in verse number one, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then right after that, he puts this note, earth made waste and empty by judgment. So you can't help but read it because it's right there in the scripture. And he goes on to say, if you look on down at his notes, he says the first creative act refers to the dateless past and gives scope for all geologic ages. Jeremiah 4, verses 23 through 26, Isaiah 24, and uh, Isaiah 45, 18 clearly indicate that the earth had undergone a cataclysmic change as a result of a divine judgment the face of the earth bears everywhere. The marks of such a catastrophe, there are not wanting imitations which connect it with a previous testing and fall of angels. Now, Exodus chapter number 20, verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the Sabbath day. Now, show me in that verse where's a gap. Where in that verse does God allow for a gap of thousands or millions of years? It's not in that verse, is it? Because God flat out says, hey, in six days, God made the heaven and the earth and what? And the sea and all that in them is and rested on the seventh, right? 